How many of you in this room woke up one day and actually asked him or herself, is this it? Is this all there is to it? Is there anything else out there for me? How many? I did. I was waking up almost every night wondering what is out there for me. I was doing everything that was expected of me, conforming to what society wanted me to do. Everything was important, my duty towards my family, towards my work, towards my society, but something was missing. One day, I was in East Africa, in a long safari, and in my last day, I was like a few hundred kilometers away from the airport. My guide stopped the car, and he asked me to step out of the car. I did. I thought he just wanted me to say goodbye to Africa. It was beautiful plains, blue skies, white fluffy clouds. And I said, thank you, it's very beautiful. He said, no, Suzanne, you're not looking closely. So I looked again, and there it was, crowning the horizon, the glacier summit of Kilimanjaro. I was mesmerized. I stood there for a few minutes, just looking at this beauty. And I just turned down to my kite and I said, in a year's time, I'm coming back and I'm climbing this mountain. A year later, with so many people calling me crazy, so many faces frowning upon me, I actually packed up and went. Of course, not knowing what to expect. Day number three, I was really miserable. Felt sorry for myself. I was in my tent, it was raining really, really hard, and it was like, what am I doing here? Is this really something for me? Can I endure? And I just realized that the only way to find out was actually just to push myself and take it one step at a time. This is all I needed, just take it one step at a time and see how far I can go. Next morning, I stuffed my swollen, blistery feet inside my rigid boots. I unzipped my tent, and I started climbing into the thin air. Four days later, I was standing on the summit of Kilimanjaro. Through the elation and the pain, I found a new calling, and I was actually addicted to mountain climbing. Many years passed by, and I started climbing everywhere. The more I climbed, the more strength I found in me. See, we are more than what we know, and once we realize this, we just cannot settle for anything less. Until I felt that maybe I am ready physically and mentally to actually attempt to climb the highest mountain on Earth, Everest, or what is called by many the last great human adventure. Who is Everest? As you know, it's the highest mountain on Earth at 8,850 meters. It sits between China and Nepal. The first expedition ever to actually attempt to climb this mountain was in 1921. It took more than 30 years for the first two men to stand on the summit of Everest, Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. It took another 30 years for the first woman to actually reach the summit from Japan. And it took another 50 years for the first Arab to stand on the summit, Zederifai from Kuwait. Our journey begins in one of the most dangerous airports in the world, Lukla, where there's a huge drop on one side and a huge mountain on the other. It makes for a very interesting landing and takeoff. And it's not for the faint-hearted. From now on, we trek into trails that we are only accompanied by either yaks or Sherpas, because everything we need for that expedition is going to be carried on someone's back. This is my first glimpse of the summit of Everest on that trip. I was at 3,900 meters. It was still 5,000 more meters above me. With the famous summit pyramid and the summit plumes that you see there that indicate hurricane force winds up on the summit. I looked at it, and I felt it was so out of reach, so huge, yet it was so inviting. I knew I was going to be pushing myself to a point I never pushed before. I knew I'm going to go through a pain barrier I have never experienced before. I looked at it, 
I actually hoped for the best and accepted the worst. What is the worst that can happen? This is a monument of a climber killed on Everest, a strong reminder of what can be at stake if something actually goes wrong higher up on the mountain. And if you thought there is only one, think again. So many reminders. How do we climb Everest? If I take any of you right now from this room, put you in a plane, drop you at the summit of Everest, it's going to take you a few minutes and you're going to pass out. It's going to take you a few more and you might actually lose your life. See, our bodies are not created to live into, in, this air, in this thin air. You have one third of the oxygen that we breathe here at sea level. So the way we do this is we use an approach that is called climb high, sleep low. What does this mean? It means I have to climb from base camp to camp one. Go all the way down. Climb again from ca base camp, camp one, camp two, then come all the way down. Climb again. Base, one, base camp, camp one, camp two, camp three, all the way down. This not only teaches, uh, uh, it tests my endurance and my stamina, but it actually means that I have to go through the same dangers, not once or twice, but many, many times. We start climbing the mountain, and the first obstacle that we have is the treacherous ice fall, and I call it the living monster. Imagine a glacier that is moving three to four feet a day. And while moving, these huge blocks of ice, some of them are the size of your car, others are the size of a multi-story building, keep moving. And just want to make sure that none of these are stumbling down the glacier while you're actually crossing. Open, while, the, while the glacier is moving, it's opening crevasses with very little warning. So the way that we climb this ice fall is that we use these fixed ropes and we use ladders. Some of these ladders can be tied together like one, two, or three together and swaying with a very deep bottomless crevasse underneath. Many people ask me, how were you able to actually cross these ladders? It was really about maximizing my courage, minimizing my fear. Whenever I was supposed to cross one of these ladders, I actually only could see the front points of my crampons, placing them accurately and precisely on the rungs of the ladder. I did not allow myself to see what was beneath, because I didn't want to be gripped by fear. We have to climb now to Camp 3, and in order to do so, this is an almost vertical ice wall, almost a 1,000 meter in height. And I don't have a laser pointer here, but if you look to the slide to your right, there are these very little dots, almost two-thirds up, that indicate Camp 3. Very exposed camp on this shelf of ice. The first time we were supposed to climb this uh, face, I woke up, was out of my tent at 5 a.m., very early in the morning, and it takes me two hours to reach the area where we take the fixed ropes and start climbing this wall. In those two hours, I just could not warm myself. I was too cold. I started jumping up and down. I started moving my arms, wiggling my fingers. Nothing worked. I reached the fixed ropes, and I tried to, fix, to, to hook myself to safety using my uh, jumar. It's a mechanical device we use to go up the rope and just my fingers were too frozen for me to do anything with them. They would just wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. My fellow climbers started climbing. I was there, waiting, thinking, but I had to make a very tough decision. It was the toughest decision I had to take during that expedition. I had to turn back. I had to turn back because the day just didn't feel right, because I didn't feel strong enough to climb that day. I went back to Camp 2, and in the safety of Camp 2, after warming myself up, I decided now, hmm, tomorrow is the rest day for my team. Maybe I will go and climb to Camp 3 and see if I can catch up with my team. And this is exactly why, what I did. So reaching Camp 3 meant that I have finished what we call my acclimatization. 
Now we're ready to go really high on the mountain. We go all the way to base camp, wait now for the weather window, when it, it might be clear up on the summit, so we climb with very little rest, very little sleep, all the way to the summit. But now we go all the way down to base camp to assess the damages. And very few women are actually going to show you this next photo, but after 40 plus days of climbing, I had second degree burns in my ears, severely burned sun face, and um, blisters on my lips, and that's the toll it took on me after 40 plus days. The moment of truth comes, the weather window. We climbed all the way to camp four. Very little rest, very little sleep, in one push. This is called the death zone. Anything above 7,500 meters is called the death zone, simply because the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere does not sustain human life. It was windy when we reached Camp 4. The wind picked up even more to a scary 80 kilometers per hour. The tent was flapping on our head. We reached Camp 4 around noon, and we were supposed to continue climbing that same night. With the wind, we thought that we might have lost our shot at the summit, and nerves were actually lost. Luckily, the wind calmed down, and the decision was that we're going to continue. We do start the climb, and at 10 p.m., it's total darkness, and the only thing that actually shows you what you're going to be climbing is your headlamp. I looked at this mountain after I assembled the tent. This is a huge mountain. What you see here is only the final 1,000 meters that I now have to climb in one push. I started climbing. My whole existence in the dark night, in the freezing night, was really just about putting that one foot in front of the other. Just one foot take four or five recovery breaths. Because this is how we climb in the altitude. Then take another step. I lost sense of time. Could have been minutes, could have been hours. I saw flashes of light coming from my left, and they were stronger than the normal headlamps from other climbers. So I looked to my left and below me, there was a lightning storm. I knew I was watching, actually, a wonder of nature. But I looked back at the wall and I continued climbing. Didn't know if it was minutes or hours. Then I saw the pink colors on the horizon from the east, on my right, and I knew it has been hours. Hmm, so I'm doing well. Maybe, maybe I have a shot at this summit. I reached the south summit, which is only 100 vertical meters away from the true summit and I started climbing. It's like a pyramid, a mix of ice and rock. When I started climbing, the ropes were fixed in a diagonal way. I climbed two-third ways up, but gravity won over, and I hung on the rope. I just hung in there. I couldn't move anymore, not one step. And I was sitting there thinking nothing, feeling Nothing. Somehow, I dug deep inside, and I found both the energy and the sense that I cannot just leave myself hanging there on the rope. I had to climb all the way up and then decide what's next. I did, and once I reached the top of the south summit, just went down on my knees, long, deep breaths to recover. And somehow, I was recharged. Somehow, adrenaline just kicked in. Somehow, I dug deep, deep inside, and I found the energy, and I knew then that I might have a chance at the summit, and that I felt I was unstoppable. Down from the south summit, you have to go down from the south summit and go to this final ridge, cross it, where thousands of meters drop on either side. One of them takes you to China, one of them takes you to Nepal. Then you have the last obstacle, which is the Hillary Step, 
the rock wall that you see in front of you, which usually at sea level we climb with no issue. But at this altitude, it can take some climbers more than 45 minutes to climb. I climbed it in very good pace. And once I was on top of the Hillary step, I just knew. I knew I was going to make it. I knew that in 20 minutes or so, I was going to stand on top of the world. After 51 days of continuous climbing, at 8.45 a.m. on May 21st, 2011, I stood on top of the world. And And I earned my summit. I stood tall and proud, feeling that I proved myself to me. I earned my own self-respect. It happened that I also became the first Arab woman to have reached the summit of Everest, but that was never what was motivating me. What was motivating me is just to see how far I can push and actually be amazed by the, re by the results every single time I pushed. No dream is too big, and no dream actually needs a miracle for it to happen. But every dream, besides passion, besides commitment, really needs hard work. Really, really hard work. Without hard work, we can reach nowhere. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, is the view from the top of the world. Thank you.